Do you have an almost 360 wave, a barber error in your lineup, or just rocking a Professor X? It's okay. Cover it up and look cool. Miss DC got a flick in my big wave cap for you. One size fits most, and it glows in the dark. If you don't, you better get your king, queen, or even baby kids one. Coming smooth to a wave near you. Instagram at D-E-Z-I-D-C. Again, that's I-G, Instagram at D-E-Z-I-D-C. David, 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 My name is Troy Andrews, better known as Trombone Shorty. I'm a musician, and I play a trumpet and trombone. I tour a lot, and I represent the great city of New Orleans. Right, bro, um, can you uh, just give the people who are hiding behind a rock, can you tell them some of the people you played for, some of the projects you've been a part of? Um, I personally think that you are one of the greatest artists, period, amongst our generation. And um, <clears throat> sometimes it bothers me that your generation and um, cause in our generation and above, bro, you're already a legend. You know, they just put up a mural for me in Jackson, Mississippi. Congratulations. And I was the only, thank you. And I was yeah. the only person that was living on um, that mural. And I think you're the same way, man. Like, all around the world, bro. I appreciate um, that, yeah. Like, give us some of your history, bro. Well, you know, I started playing when I was four, and I grew up around people like the Neville Brothers and mm-hmm. Alan Toussaint, the Meters, and stuff like that. And then that led into playing Rebirth Brass Band, people in the street, the way we grew up playing here in the second lines and different things. And then uh, as I got older and musical doors started to open up, I went on tour right out of high school with Lenny Kravitz. Mm-hmm. I was in his band at 18 tour with him for a few years and from that different things happened I was able to work with U2 and Green Day and uh shit I didn't know that and we bought <laughs> for real yeah yeah we done something we, we reopened up the Louisiana the New Orleans Superdome uh right after Katrina for a big NFL game but I had met with them prior to that event in the Abbey Road studio in London mm-hmm. so it was me uh Green Day the whole band the U2 mm-hmm. And Rick Rubin and Bob Ezrin, and we sitting there, here I am, like 18, 19 years old, we discussing the um, the reopening of the New Orleans Superdome. Right. And and then, you know, different things like that. I've worked with different country artists, Zach Brown and mm-hmm. you and Juvenile and Miss. It goes all over. I've recorded with you two. I've recorded with Eric Clapton, mm-hmm. Neck Fu and France. Different, I've been able to be in all type of situations mm-hmm. musically. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to tell y'all how our friendship is. I, I'll call Trombone just on the humble. And uh, he'd be like, yeah, baby, I was just over here with O. <laughs> I'm like, O? Well, yeah, Obama. <laughs> 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 um, like, tell us, man, like the, the the history of just New Orleans. Because the reason why I'm here today is because we are working on something very special or the Third Good Marshall um, College Fund. And we're creating something because a lot of kids, because of COVID, doesn't have, they don't have an opportunity to go to homecoming this year. I want to, the reason why I came down here to make sure that you were a part of it, because I know how connected Louisiana as a whole, you know, I went to Southern, mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know, and uh, the band at Southern, when I went there, was more powerful than the football team. Like, people oh, yeah, would come yeah. to the games, yeah, yeah, yeah. but the football was like a byproduct of halftime. That's right, that's right. Um, talk about just the connection of New Orleans and, and music in general. Well, I think, you know, a lot of music started here way back in the day, coming from the jazz and 
uh, you know, the slaves being able to be who they were. So in New Orleans, you had the enslaved people that we have a place here called Congo Square. And what they were able to do is they, they, they didn't entirely strip them of their, their culture that they had out in Africa. They were able to go there on Sundays or whatever day it was and, and speak their language and play with drums and stuff out of that. And then you got these European instruments, the horns and all that, and that, that kind of was the creator of jazz. And out of that, a lot of music came funk and R&B and different things started to just grow from there. But New Orleans is one of those melting pots. It's just a beautiful thing. Like, I love the fact that I, I can... I can go down the street and, and jam with Ivan Neville and come right here to the studio and be working with Juvenile and have that from different spectrums, ends of the spectrum, but we are New Orleans and we get to create things together. And it's just a beautiful place for me to grow up and to be a fan of music and to play music. I wouldn't change it for anything in the world. It's so deep rooted here. I mean, you you know, they got people on the street when they, they might see you and they might sing your name, you know, like, what's up, Banner? You know, <laughs> Like it's always a note when I see people in the street, even people that's not musician. Everybody has some type of musical bone in their body here. You wanna know something crazy that you say that? We noticed that when I first went to Southern, folk from New Orleans they walk with a bop. Yeah, like yeah. y'all walk. It's a it's a dance. It's like a, like the a, same yeah. thing. The way that that's the way right. that y'all dance is literally the way that y'all walk when y'all go into the store. That's like right. Somebody that's walking right. to the corner store like they literally yeah, yeah. walking. Like it's 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 a bop. And it's literally a way that y'all live here. This was the first place that I ever seen gangsters. I'm talking about people that I know then kill four or five people. Oh, yeah, they're Where right. we from, gangsters don't dance at all. Right. Like here, y'all gang, I'm talking about straight up killers dance all night. Oh, yeah, yeah. Even when people die, they take the, 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 uh, this the second is one, line. Yeah, yeah, second line, and they, they go in the bar and yeah, put yeah, the yeah. casket on the bar. And, and, and lift it up in the air. Yeah. It's going, if, if they're able to get it in the person's house, they'll take it into the room where he was at or uh. where that person was at. That's just, we celebrate life here and we dance. Like, it's probably one of the only uh, cities in the world where you'll see people actually dancing at funerals. Mm -hmm. You know, everywhere else is really somber and sad and different yeah. things like that. But, but, but here we... Is a is a um, cell a home going celebration, mm -hmm. and we sending them home. So like like you say, the gangsters dance, everybody dance. You know, it's funny, man. In some African cultures, they believe when when you're born, that's a reason to cry, because they're taking you away from God. Ah, you with God, and then when you're born, you're ripped out of God's hand, right. and then you got to deal with what we deal, and then when you what we deal with, and then when you die. You're going back to the essence. That's right. So I think y'all got it right and the rest of us got it wrong if you think about it. Like well, the pain think is about, over. Yeah. When you think like that, that's what it is. But I think that's just embedded in us. Like we never thought about it in that type of sense, yeah. but it's just a natural instinct that we have here. And that's just the way we were taught and it was passed along that we do that no matter what. So t tell, explain to the people you know, how important... Homecoming is to our people, especially in the South. Because one of the things I learned that a lot of people, our people go all over the world, you know. We I just got off the phone, I mean, I just got off an interview with Guapale and we were talking about just in the Bay Area about how like two shorts, mom is from New Orleans. Okay. And his dad is from Jackson, Mississippi. I like that. You know, and it's the same thing with uh it's the same thing with uh it's the head that the, the head singer of Tony Tony Tony, um, Raphael Sadiq. Raphael Sadiq is yeah, the yeah, same thing, yeah, yeah. I believe. And and I may have it mixed up, but I think like his his okay. dad is maybe from New Orleans and his mom is from Mississippi. It's that might like, have been like a little homecoming by your classic, right? Thing, you know. So so let's talk about how important just homecoming is to to us Southerners in general. I mean, you know. Uh, all of my friends, they were able to go to college and they come back mm -hmm. and go from Southern, yourself included. Uh, my saxophone player, he went out. He was in Florida and he always trying to get me to go out because mm -hmm. I kind of missed all of that by being on the road. Yeah, because you went straight from right. high school. I went to, straight right. to, to touring and uh, and and it's, I haven't stopped. Actually, this COVID situation is the longest break I've had since uh -huh. I was eighteen. Uh -huh. So, but homecoming, I get to experience the the Bayou Classic mm -hmm. and all of that type of stuff and people from different classes from 68 and uh, everybody come together. And it's just a beautiful reunion that I see. And the music 
it's like a big family reunion. You know, you get together, you got different little activities around the city of his certain class of certain years or whatever it may be, meeting up and mm-hmm. and having that old school dance and the youngsters are out on Bourbon Street, wherever it may be. But it's very important. It's a part of our culture. Mm-hmm. And uh, people look forward to that mm-hmm. every day, all year. Well, I want you to know that that's what we that's the reason why I'm here. And that was the reason why I wanted you to be a part of this is because for some people, that's their only connection to our culture. Mm-hmm. Like I, what I was trying to say was like some parents who are, you know, they, they move to London or they move to L.A. and they move to New York. They move to all of these different places. A lot of people, we have integrated our children into other people's culture and the black college they send actually they send their children a lot of times to HBCU mm-hmm. hoping hoping that they can get a sense of black culture mm-hmm. and homecoming is a very big part of that and because of covid that connection has been ripped from our people right so the third good marshall college fund we're using this opportunity along with a banner vision to give people their virtual homecoming mm-hmm. and bro um I knew how much I know how much music means to you, and that was one of the reasons why I really wanted you to be a part of it, man. And plus, because of our friendship, bro. Mm-hmm. And I know how much music means to you. So with this opportunity, bro, we're actually going to give people, you know, a homecoming. So, yeah, like, yeah. let's talk about the song that that we're making right now, bro. Like, tell us what were you thinking about, and and how did you feel about even being a part of this project? Well, first, whenever you call, I'm always excited. It can be anything. It's yeah. straight hip hop or whatever we're doing with this song. But it's a beautiful thing. When I heard it, it gave me the feeling of a, of a Bayou classic for right. me, you know, like Southern and Grambling coming down. And I actually got a chance to play with Southern uh, at the Bayou Classic, and, and they played one of my songs. And then Grambling reached out and, and made me an honorary member okay. of the band. And, and um, the, Don't do that again. My bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just so y'all know, man, it, it, it ain't no beef, man. Uh, Gremlin is the rival school to Southern where I went yeah, to. That's and it. And it's funny, um, Erica Badu, she went to Gremlin. She went there, yeah. So she used to call me the night before uh, uh, Gremlin with the Bayou Classic would uh-huh. come. And Erica Badu would literally call me, and we know her as the queen. Yeah. She would call me like, we going to whoop y'all ass in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> like every, every Bayou Classic, she would call me the night that we would argue you, huh? the night before and we would argue. Um, but like seriously, bro, like e- e- explain like oh, and shouts out to THX. He was the creator of the track. Okay, uh, he okay. works for Banner Vision. Yeah. But like like talk about just being a part of it from that aspect now that you know that this is literally gonna be a virtual homecoming for people. I mean, it, it's a blessing. Like I said, I never got to truly experience as going to college and being in an HBCU and getting that experience. But to be able to be around people like yourself and all that, I'm able to experience through you. And to be a part of that and be at a virtual thing is a, mm-hmm. is an incredible honor for me. And like I said, as soon as I heard it, it brought me back to childhood when I used to see uh, Southern marching down the Zulu parade. And I was like, I want to be in that band. And then I got the opportunity to play with them. And, uh, and to be able to be a part of this and, and what you're going to do on top of it is just incredible. And uh, it, it feels great, you know. I'm happy to be a part of that because this has to happen. We, we can't just let it fall and not have it, you know. Mm-hmm. But as it, if you, you're able to bring somewhat of that sense, even though it's not what we do in person, we're able to keep that spirit alive some type of until way. Until so, we're able to get back out there. And we able to, yeah, until we're able to get back out right. there. And you never know. And when this whole project come out, you might have the people dressing up in their old yeah. school stuff or whatever it may be, and they might use this at their house mm-hmm. to have a, a family homecoming right. with, with everything. So it, it's a powerful moment. I'm just happy to be a part of it. So let me tell you something that I did not have an opportunity to tell you. Uh, when... When they picked a, van- a banner vision to be um, the facilitator and producers of the one of the largest uh, fundraisers for black people, especially for them to go to colleges, I asked um, the the lady who allowed my company. You know, she presented my company to the Third Good Marshall um, company as a whole, and I asked her. I said, "Why?" Why did you push so hard for a banner vision? And she said something that was so powerful. She said, imagine the story that we're able to tell the children that 
the person who facilitated this is actually from a HBCU. Yeah. So not only are we supporting the fact that we want to send our children to historically black colleges, but we also support the companies who are headed who are headed by people who graduated from the places that we're sending our children. Absolutely. Then she told me, bro, and it really, it blew my face off. She said, that's going to inspire the children, but you were also the SGA president. And watch this. She said that you are the head of an independent, revolutionary, successful black company. So not only are we showing our kids that we want you to go to HBCUs, but then we're also going to support you after you graduate. That's right. I mean, that, my head, bro. that's a powerful thing. You right. know, we, we help create people like you and we bring them back to, to expose the other kids that may be like, oh, we don't see ourselves working for ourselves. So that's a beautiful thing that she did. And I'm glad that you got that because that, that will inspire the next generation to let them know I can come from an HBCU and be something and come back and help and help create the next generation. That's, that's what we have to do is keep that type of cycle going. I, I want to tell you something really powerful. Um, one of the reasons why, and I didn't tell you this, that I wanted you to be a part of this project is because I've been through so much in music that my innate love for music was sort of stripped away from me. And like when I see... Why is that? Um, just the business aspect yeah, yeah, of yeah. it. And I think the most high allowed that to happen to me so I could become the head of a corporation and I could shield that away from the people who really love music. Bro, when I see you... And I see the parts when other people don't see how much you love your horn, how much you sit down and break down literally from a science perspective, mm -hmm. how you gonna do a song, just your love for music, bro. I remember when I was that way. Mm -hmm. I remember when, you know, um, Sali says, um, who works for a band of vision, he always say, bro, you act like music was a girl. When I talked to him about how just the music industry broke my heart right, right. when I was able to get to a certain level, some kind of way, bro, you were able to keep that that childish love and admiration that you have for music. Like we always talk, every time I try to talk business with you, you always tell me, bro, just we'll handle that part. Let's yeah. get the music aspect yeah. um, taken care of. How were you able to keep that love for music? Well, I gotta, I gotta give all the credit to being from here. Mm -hmm. You know, we, you know, I've been playing since I was four. So being in New Orleans, we learn to play for people first before we even come into the studio. That's why sometimes um, when we get in the studio, some of our New Orleans people, we play as if we plan in the street and sometimes are playing in a club or whatever it may be and sometimes that doesn't translate right. you know but for me I, ju I just play music because I've been playing it for a long time I love it and even though we get into some of the music business you just talk about that really doesn't bother me when it comes it comes but my main focus is being a musician by any means if I if I grow to become famous or whatever it doesn't matter like I can get in here during this whole COVID situation, I've been in here by myself going from drums, piano, bass, my horns, and I'm smiling. No, Charlie's not here, nobody's here, and I'm just playing because I have to get it out. And like, I would play, it doesn't matter how much money I get paid or how less money I get paid. When I'm performing, I don't even think about none of that. You know, I'm just performing as if this is my last time. But for me, the love for the music has always been the thing. Like, I never played. Well, first of all, I was too young to even know that you can become famous to, right. or whatever it may be. Uh, you know, I was getting paid with my brothers and stuff, but it was just a little pocket change. I can go buy some frozen cups and stuff like that, uh, PlayStations or whatever it may be. But for me, it's always been just the love of music, and not, I'm not chasing fame or hit records or whatever that may be to get to a certain level. And for me in life, uh, honestly, my music and, and the joy and the passion that I have for it has led me to where I am. And the people can, I guess they can feel the gen uh, genuine love that I have for music no matter where I go. So if, if, if I had to retire today, I'm perfectly fine because I've, I've accomplished so much musically through music. Right. 
It, it, it wasn't paid for. It wasn't this big campaign. It wasn't all of that. It's just straight up music. And, right. and that's, what, that's what makes me stay with it. Watch this. Okay. Give me the lowest point when you were playing music and like, like a situation where you were playing music and you was like, damn. In my life, I remember, you know, recording and then going home and having to sleep next to dogs and it was feces and urine on the floor. I'll never forget that. And I remember being in a situation where I was just about to go crazy. And this was before we, you know, uh, uh, long distance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, calls were right. so cheap. And I remember my mom staying on, I felt like I was going crazy. And I remember my mom staying on the phone with me all night. This call probably ended up costing me and my mom like $500. And we didn't, both didn't have no money. Right, right. But I remember my mom staying on the phone with me. And I fell asleep while we were talking. And when I woke up, she was still on the phone. I ain't that so. That was like the lowest point in my life. I want you to tell me that part of your life, you know, being here playing music, you were still happy. And I know the second live music is so happy, but there's mm-hmm. an other side to that. Mm-hmm. And then I want you to tell me the point that you figured, like, damn, I did this shit. Well, I haven't experienced any low points like that mm-hmm. because I started so so young. Mm-hmm. And so if you look from ages four all the way up to 34, what I, mm-hmm. which I am now, it's always been a gradual build. Right. And by me being a musician, I've always been able to play. If that, oh, was, yeah. if, if that was in the street, in the French Quarter, or if I'm going to play for a birthday party, right. and then go on stage. And I get what you're saying, because in New Orleans, there's always a crowd. There's always a crowd. Yeah. You know? Music is culture here. Right. right. So it's going to pop whether it's you or Whatever. James Brown. It's going to be yeah. the same amount of people because right. they're going to party. I never thought about yeah. it that way. Wow. So I've been able to play and 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 hone my gift and practice and and hopefully get better mm-hmm. and bigger or whatever it may be but I've never had like a a situation to where I wanted to give up mm-hmm. because I've never put my horn down like uh-huh. I've never had that moment to where and that's just here you know you we can go in a french quarter and see some of the musicians their career might have slowed down, but if you go talk to them, they didn't play it on stage with some of the biggest people, but now they're playing in the street with the box, mm-hmm. but they never stopped playing. Right. So even though that may be the lowest point for them, playing music is always the highest mm-hmm. point. I think for me, the hardest thing is playing a bunch of funerals here for people that been killed or ch- children that's been killed. Mm-hmm. I think that, that, you know, we played a million funerals, but... Whenever I see like a youngster, a teenager, and we going to play a second line, uh, I've played a second line for people that was my age back then. That probably was the lowest emotional mm-hmm. point. Shout out to Weeby. You know, shout out to Weeby, you know, playing for people like that. But that's what we do, you know. Mm-hmm. Even though that was low, the music still kept us high. Right. And, and even uh, doing those periods, and doing it's still those a point of joy right. in the music. It's still a point of right. Right. During right. that period, even if we playing for a sad occasion, the music lifts everybody up. Right. You'll see people so sad at a funeral and when the second line starts and we walking outside, you'll see people crying, but they jamming and they dancing as if they're not going to dance no more right. because we, we, we feel as though that that person can feel this energy that we're giving to them. Right. So I, I've never had like a low point like that. I've never had a, 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 a doubt in my mind that I should stop playing music. Right. I never experienced that. So what's that? High point, cause I, bro, and the reason why, and I told him before we did this interview, bro, he one of the most humble. Like I, I believe you are a walking legend, bro. I appreciate that. But you one of the humble, humblest cats ever, bro. I will call this dude and I'll be like, "What you doing, bro? Oh, nothing, man. I'm, you know, and just in, in, I'm in Paris with Lenny, man. Who, like, oh, Kravis, man? You know." Just, you know. I called him one time. I was like, hold on. I bet I'm going to have to call you back. I'm about to go on stage for Obama. What? <laughs> <laughs> Give us that, that moment, bro, where it was, was sort of surreal. That was definitely a plan for Obama. I've played for him at least five or six times, and it's been a beautiful pleasure and honor for me. My mom, she's more excited than me. She actually took the horn that I played with him yeah. and was like, we got to keep this at home. So I had to switch to another instrument. Because my mom, that was a moment for all of us. But that was definitely um, one of the high points. Well, you know what? 
Whenever I get to play music, it's all high to me. It I doesn't, knew he was you gonna know. do that, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. Just get the people yeah, no. on my. I told you he was gonna do me like that, bro. Just give me, give me. But that's the moment. Right. So I, 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 so I was supposed to play. I remember I was supposed to play here at the House of Blues a right. day before Mardi Gras, mm-hmm. and they called uh, a week before and said they wanted me to be a part of this uh, red, white, and blues concert, mm-hmm. and. Uh, and I'm like, okay. And they were like, well, you got to cancel. I said, well, who? They were like, at the White House. I was like, of course. Yeah. So I left, and I didn't play the thing here. And it was so nice because when I got there, uh, the chef of the White House at the time, he knew that I was from New Orleans. Right. So he sent me up a shrimp po' boy. Right. And I was like, oh, I'm at home now. Yeah. But that was a surreal moment because I'm on stage with B.B. King, who I always wanted to perform with, and I got the chance to perform in front of Obama and Michelle Obama um, at that moment. So it's like B.B. King, Gary Clark Jr., uh, Jeff Beck, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Mick Jagger from the Rolling Stones. Mm -hmm. And I'm already looking at all of these people, and I'm like, oh, my God, this is a dream. And then I open my eyes, and there's the first lady and the president. I'm like, oh. So that that was great, and plus I got to represent Represent my five or four people, yeah. and uh, and do that. But that was definitely uh, one of the top moments of my my life and career.